renovate and rehouse India's art and cultural heritage and translate those ideas into on-ground execution of uh, many of the key projects. So I'd like to now invite Mr. Bobin Mohan to please give the keynote to us. My senior colleague and secretary in the Department of Pharmaceuticals, Government of India, Srimati S. Aparna. My dear friend, Sri Adil Zainal Bhai, chairperson of the Capacity Building Commission. Distinguished colleagues and representatives from the Supreme Court of India, from the Department of Posts. Ministry of Railways and the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Let me welcome you to this panel discussion, which immediately comes after the high point of this three day international expo, which was the keynote address of our Honorable Prime Minister. I take this opportunity to congratulate you all on this 47th International Museum Day. It is indeed a proud day for curators, artists, researchers, educationists, and all those who are privileged to work in this very interesting sphere. This year's celebrations are even more special as India heads the G20 presidency. The International Museum Expo is designed to initiate a holistic conversation on museums and to enable them to evolve as cultural centers that play a pivotal role in India's cultural diplomacy. We have also entered the second phase of Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav, an initiative of the government of India to celebrate and commemorate 75 years of independence and the glorious history of its people, culture, and achievements. Akin to the unsung freedom fighters is the role of the legions of museum professionals as custodians of our history, heritage, art, and culture. Museums are powerhouses that have the potential to recharge a nation and inspire new generations. They serve as a bridge between culture and communities by making people aware of the common belongingness of the past that they share. Their primary role as a disseminator of knowledge provides an impetus that ignites young minds and nurtures curiosity. Modern museums have something to all visitors, young or old, educated or unlettered. While museums cultivate and cherish the past, it is imperative that they also look towards the future. It is a matter of pride for all of us that our museums have continued to grow and evolve and incorporate sustainable development goals, technology and innovation have kept them ahead of the times. This year, the theme of the International Museum Day is aptly museums, sustainability, and well-being. As key contributors and trusted institutions, as part of our shared social fabric, museums are uniquely positioned to foster positive change. They support climate action, foster inclusivity, tackle social isolation, and boost mental health. The Lifestyle for Environment mission that was introduced at COP26 in Glasgow in 2021, calling upon the global community of individuals and institutions to pledge mindful and deliberate utilization instead of mindless and destructive consumption is also in line with this year's theme. The Ministry of Culture is the parent ministry for the development of museums in the country and provides financial assistance to other central government ministries and departments, state governments, autonomous bodies, PSUs, trusts through the Museum Grant Scheme and the Scheme for Promotion of the Culture of Science. Over the last decade, we have facilitated the setting up of 383 museums, one third of the total number presently in the country. We have also digitized over three lakh objects under the Jatan project in order to democratize museum collections for visitors and researchers alike. While our museums undertake robust public programming, inviting more people through their doors, the Ministry of Culture is also developing cultural spaces in five cities across India, 
in Delhi, Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Varanasi, and Kolkata. The Mumbai Automation Kostum was launched on March 19 this year with a celebration at the Gateway of India. In this connected world we live in today, technology and its rapid growth has led to creating processes for the preservation and propagation and proliferation of culture much easier, thereby reaching a wider audience. At this expo, between original pieces, digital versions and physical replicas, you get to visit the collections of more than 20 plus museums and institutions across the country. The Conservation Lab showcases a step-by-step -step process of determining the status of the artifact that needs to be conserved and its specificities. Finally, the confluence of painted media and sound gives a more enhanced experience of artwork being presented in the Rag Mala ex exhibition. The exhibition brings together physical Rag Mala series of paintings, portraying seasonal and musical references with an addition of the corresponding audio rap embedded in each painting to enhance the visual experience of art with the auditory experience of music as a digital tech innovation that value adds to audience immersion. And finally, the plethora of vendors showcasing futuristic and immersive technologies at the Techno Mela is testament to the fact that museums of the future will make the shift from artifact to audience. By witnessing such a wide celebration of museum programs, we will be nudged towards a deeper understanding of the great cultural collage of this nation. So as we usher in the Amritkal, our vision for museums in 2047 remains steadfast. Our focus remains in the four P's, programming, publishing for professionals and public, through thoughtful curation and storytelling. With that, I now declare the stage open and look forward to hearing from my friends and colleagues from other ministries, from other sectors, and from other walks of life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mohan, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you also for the enormous support and uh, stewardship that you bring uh, to this particular sphere. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, ladies and gentlemen, we're really delighted to have uh, such an interesting panel uh, of speakers join us today. Which will, uh, as they will share their experiences, we'll get to hear from each of them uh, as they share their knowledge and experience with us. We have with us the Capacity Building Commission, which uh, facilitates preparation of the annual Capacity Building Plans for all the ministries and the departments. And we've got Mr. Adil Zenulmai, the chairperson, with us, and I'd like to begin with him. Uh, Mr. Zainulbai, do we have adequate museums? And if you uh, say that you know they're not adequate, what have we done to develop these across uh, the departments? If you could please throw some light on them. Thank you very much, and thank you to my colleagues on the stage for inviting me and Gobind. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk. Um, Honorable Prime Minister raised a very interesting idea on museums. As you think about how many museums do we need, he asked whether every household could create a museum, Correct. right, of their own, of uh, things that were interesting for that family uh, or for that environment. So in a sense, if we broaden our minds to what a museum is and what it's supposed to do, I think you could say we need infinite museums. Uh, there'll never be enough. I think China has 10,000 or 15,000 museums but the PM's view is that we should have 300 million museums. That's how many households we have. So I think we can break that down to why, what, what is the purpose of the museum and what would we like it to do? And I'd like to highlight that. You're going to be distracted by the workers who are working in the back. I thought somebody was shouting fire or something. No. <laughs> so, and I'd like to start out by saying one of the most important roles of a museum is to allow every citizen of the country and every visitor to have a unique understanding and interaction with the history, with art and with crafts and with culture. And how you do that, in the past we did that by collecting various artifacts and housing them in one place because that's the best way we could look after them and then allowing everyone to interact with them. 
And when we did that, you know, we had uh, we have museums that attract 100,000 people or a million people a year. And uh, the Abu Dhabi Museum said that they got a million people. You know, in comparison to that, uh, one of our uh, one of our big temples in India, any one of our big temples in India, gets 50 million visitors. Uh, at one, you know, the Taj gets something like seven or eight or ten million visitors. And I think we have to think about this as no matter how brilliant the museum is, it doesn't reach everyone. It's just not possible to reach everyone. And so, what can we do to change that? and get everybody to interact with the museum. Why can't a billion people interact with the Indian Museum? Why can't a billion people interact with the best collections that we have in India? So the access, uh, so when we talk about number of museums, I think about access. If every one of us could get access to uh, your uh, mascot, right? Which very few people have actually seen the actual statue. Now maybe they'll see a lot more. But why couldn't we, you know, could we get a billion people to really, really see the Ashoka Chakra, to really see the lions and interact with it at its original scale and size? Then it is the museum, sort of museum, has served its purpose. So I think we shouldn't count on how many museums, although we need a lot more, but count on how many, uh, how many people have experienced it. Uh, how many children have experienced it, how many adults have experienced it, and how they're getting the value and benefit of what is out there. And when we do that, then really uh, we will have achieved it. Yeah, so coming to your point about you know making it as uh, accessible and available for people, immersive experiences are really not foreign to us. I mean, we've got large installations, we've had cathedrals, we've got palaces, uh, all available to us and made by our artists. And yet, in the recent um, decades, we've got art primarily being exhibited in this white cube, as it were, uh, in, a, in a very antiseptic, in a very um, you know, cerebral, anonymous setting. Uh, do you think that we need to bring back the immersive experience, bring back that for public fascination and for public interaction? Uh, and, and are our museums equipped for doing that? So I would say that uh, I don't think we should bring back the past but think about it in a better way for the future and make it immersive uh, and make people experience it. And the great advantage, and I'm glad you have a techno, you have a techno hall yeah, over here, yes. right? So, uh, the beauty of uh, the beauty of uh, uh, using technology is you can make uh, experiences immersive uh, in a way that we couldn't do in the past and we are not doing today. For example, you know, many, many, many people visit the Red Fort, quite a lot, and they walk through it. But in a very short period of time, we are able to create a virtual reality walk through the Red Fort at a time when there were people living in it, when the armies were there, when the uh, you know when the kings were there, uh, we can take any we can take the you know we can take the universities that you just showed. I think a picture of some of our ancient universities in your new museum. You know, wouldn't it be great if everybody sitting in their home could walk through those universities? You know what it looked like when those universities had five thousand monks over there, right? So I think we have to. Leapfrog. Don't go back to the old immersive experiences. Can we create new immersive experiences so that it brings it life for a very, very large number of people uh, and they can feel it in a way that you couldn't feel it. And with new technologies coming, you will not just see it in 3D, but you will be able to smell. You know, you can get the yes. smell, you can get the feel, you can get the light uh, and all of that. And then you really get an experience that we've never had before. So I think I would say we have a great opportunity to use technology to make immersive experiences for everybody available and a very large number of people will be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, I see that Mr. Subhan Shpant has arrived. May I request Mr. Pant to please join us up on stage? Um, Mr. Zenmanai, I'd like to uh, you know, just probe a little deeper and ask you if you want you know, if you envisage the future for the museums of India, I mean, do you see, what do you see if you do look at, you know, 20 years from now, what do you think a museum is going to be? Uh, you know, we have, uh, 
as we look ahead in Amrit Kaal and to 2047, mm. one of the things that Honorable has encouraged us to do is to say, in many fields, we be not just catching up, but we should be better and we should be than anyone else and set the standard. Uh, we are also very strong in digital technology and we are setting the standard for the world in digital public goods like UPI, Aadhaar, etc. So I think when we think about museums, I think our challenge should be why don't we, we should create the museum experience and the museums that is better than anything in the world. Today if I look at the, if you ask anyone around the world, not museum professionals, but just people who go to museums to name their top 20 museums and their top 20 experiences, no Indian museum is one of them. I think 20 years from now, we should have such interesting and different museums that people be, you know, that we are setting the standard for the world. I don't think we should you know, create a Louvre. I think we, are going to, we should create something better than that, using the technology and some things that are new. And we fully have the capability to do it. We fully have the artifacts to do it. I think you have a better collection in terms of numbers than the Louvre. I think in terms of art, objects. So we should not aim to be just a museum. We should aim to be something new. And maybe we'll come up with a great word for it. Goel always comes up with a great Hindi word that, you know, and maybe around the world they will say, gee, can we have one of those? I think that is what we should aim for. And I'm completely convinced that we can get there. It requires some imagination. It requires a little bit of money, but not as much as uh, uh, some others have spent around the world. And in 20 years, I fully expect that one Indian whatever, you come up with a wonderful word, Govind, uh, will be among the top 10 museums. As they say in Indian, Aapke Mumbai Ki Shakhar, I hope that this comes true and I know that uh, Mr. Mohan is probably uh, already you know, planning out uh, his next move. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, India is blessed with a long coastline and it uh, would therefore seem logical that there will be uh, you know, plenty of maritime history that needs to be chronicled, which needs to be studied and to be conserved. And we've got Mr. Sudhan Shmant here, Secretary, Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways. Uh, and I'd like to request him to please throw light on the existing maritime museums, if there are any, uh, or is this limited to the naval uh, forces? Do tell us if there are. Namaskar. Thank you for this opportunity. The maritime history of uh, India, it goes back to around 5,000 years. The Harappans were the first to develop the maritime trade contact. And uh, the, the archaeological excavations have shown that shipbuilding activities were existing in a place called Lothal in Gujarat, about 100 kilometers from Ahmedabad where a dock has been excavated, it has been restored, it is still there at, at the site. And in the Harappan age, the huge revenues were collected from the maritime trade. And uh, the Greco-Roman trade contact helped the Indians to develop the second urbanization around the 4th century BC. The iron and steel technologies travelled from the Indian subcontinent to the Korean Peninsula around 1200 BC, all through the maritime route. The Cholas, the Pandyas, the Marathas and Chatpati Shivaji Maharaj, they developed very strong naval power and which was used not only for security but also for trade and protection of resources. And Buddhism travelled to China, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia through this maritime contact. So, historically the Indian maritime trade and contacts have had a very significant role. Unfortunately, in the present day we don't have any maritime museum worth its name in the country. So that is why with the inspiration of Honorable Prime Minister, a project was announced in Lothal which is the site of the ancient Harappan museum, sorry, ancient Harappan uh, uh, city and as well as the 
dock which has been discovered there. Of course, now the sea has receded, and now this uh, Lothal place is about 20 kilometers away from the seashore. But in those days, it says uh, it is uh, believed that the sea used to be right up to the Lothal point. So um, this was announced in the budget of 2020, and a very grand museum is coming up in Lothal, which is being implemented by the ministry. Do tell us more, sir. Yes. So this, this museum, this complex, it's a very huge complex, uh, measuring more than 375 acres. It is going to have 14 different galleries, one on orientation and oceanic mythologies, second one on Harappan, pioneer seafarers, third gallery on post-Harappan trajectories, the impact of climate change, then India's contact with the Greco-Roman world, then there's a special exhibition gallery, there is a gallery on journey of the Indian Navy and Indian Coast Guard, there is a trade and cultural relations with Southeast Asia and beyond, then a gallery on the maritime traditions of Gujarat, then one on the age of Emporia contact, then one on Maratha naval power, one on the arrival of the Europeans, there is a children's gallery, there is a gallery on the traditional shipbuilding and navigation techniques of India, and there is a gallery on Indian shipping post-independence. So these are just the galleries. Apart from these galleries, some of the other important features which are coming up. The Lothal, entire Lothal town, the 5,000 year old town is being recreated as a model, as a miniature. Then there is going to be a 5D dome auditorium. Then there is a bagicha complex. There is going to be a lighthouse museum. And it is going to have one of the world's highest lighthouses actually installed there. Then there is going to be an underwater marine museum, which is one of the biggest in the world. There will be a nature conservation park. There will be four theme-based parks one maritime and naval theme park, one monument theme park, one climate change theme park and one adventure and amusement park. There is going to be a maritime institute and hostel. There is going to be a Lothal city with a real-time experience of the civilization. There are going to be coastal pavilions of all the coastal states which are going to be developed by the respective states and union territories, the, the nine coastal states of India. And they will showcase not only the maritime culture, but also the, the general culture, arts, festivals, etc. Then there is a hospitality zone which will have a museum hotel, which will be a hotel, which will be given out on public-private partnership mode, plus a maritime theme ecological resort. Then there will be a navy gallery, which will be outside. There is a navy and coast guard gallery inside. And there's a navy gallery outside, which will have artifacts like the INS Nishan, the Sea Harrier jet plane, a war helicopter, missile launchers, etc. So the entire complex is being designed in a very grand manner. Has Ta work begun on this? Yes, the work has begun. Tata Projects Limited is doing the work. Phase 1A of this project, we are hoping to get it inaugurated by January of 2024. The Hafiz contractor and company is the project management consultant and the chief designers for this project. It is coming up in a very big way. It's going to be uh, three years down the line. It's going to be an entire, I mean, people can, can come there, spend a full day. There's going to be a resort. There are going to be hotels, parking for some 1,500 vehicles, etc. So it's going to be a, a destination in itself. That is how it is being planned. And the work started in uh, March of last year, and it is project is being implemented in phases. So it's it's uh, coming up in a very uh, big way, and the grand vision of the Honorable Prime Minister that is trying that we are trying to uh, uh, implement and recreate on the ground. So that is some general information which I wanted to share on this uh, great museum which is coming up. And internationally also, there are very few maritime museums in the world. There is one in Denmark, one in Netherlands, one in Australia, one in China, one in San Diego, USA, one in Sweden, 
वन न्यूजीलैंड वन इन ग्रेनिच इंग्लैंड एंड वन इन इस्तानबुल so apart from lothal are there any other maritime museums that we have in the country in the country as i said in the beginning there are very very small scale and uh, limited number of museums there is a small museum in chennai there is one in shakapatnam so likewise there are very small museums nothing compared to the scale in which we are planning this grand uh, museum now thank you so much sir thank you uh, Well, ladies and gentlemen not many of you will be aware that uh, you know the high courts and the supreme court of india also have museums that preserve and showcase valuable materials on the judicial and administrative system of the past uh, many high court museums have large collections of 4 to 500 year old rare documents comprising of judgments of decrees of uh, orders and we've got with us the registrar of the supreme court of india dr kumar narayan uh, Ma'am, could I ask you to elaborate on, um, you know, the ten museums in high courts across the country, and about the management strategies for this? First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'm glad to represent the judiciary. I think this is the first time judicial museums are represented. Uh, I am registrar museum of Supreme Court of India. and in supreme court uh, we have an exclusive museum wherein we have the uh, judicial records and the artifacts and uh, we have the supreme court museum has some of its own and other many are borrowed from the high court select high courts uh, about the high courts i would say that uh, the chartered high courts have large collections they have like uh, bombay madras and i guess calcutta should be having a lot of records but they unfortunately they don't have a museum uh, but bombay high court uh, we were fortunate enough that uh, honorable prime minister uh, modi ji had uh, inaugurated it in uh, 2015 and uh, there we have shown the legal history of bombay and then we have extended the portion where um, 2019 we have uh, we have extended a portion where we have shown the ancient history of deccan the medieval the maratha period the judicial system during the maratha period during the peshwa period and of course the portuguese period uh, then the connection will lead to the english period which we had covered in the main museum so are these all physically represented or is it digitized now uh, it is uh, now presently all are the traditional museums but i would like to mention here the vision of our honorable chief justice of india dr dhananjay chandrachur his vision is that we uh, need to uh, set up a national judicial museum and archives and we are at the planning stage uh, wherein a uh, lot of things that we should have include technology use ar vr ai and have interactive exhibits wherein we are going to portray uh, the legal luminaries and also give some important cases the well known cases uh, which might be interesting for the common man the basic thing is to reach the common people they should know what is the legal history what is the judicial history so we are in, at the planning stage and i hope it that works out uh we need the support of minister of culture <laughs> is very soon come to you uh so once that is there i expect that that should be uh, a state of art museum wherein we are going to include all the high courts also not even high courts but all the district courts like uh, many districts are having their own uh, historical documents like in maharashtra i'm sorry i'm talking about maharashtra and bombay more because i'm basically from bombay high court i was heading the museum there too i was there while the museum was being set up there and now i am in supreme court on deputation so here also having the right so, so tell us a little more about the supreme court collections what is the kind of material so supreme court we are having two galleries uh, it was formally inaugurated uh, in 2004 by honorable uh, the then honorable chief justice we and khare and uh, in ground floor and the basement we are having the ground floor is shows the evolution uh, evolution of the indian judicial system 
and on the basement we are showing the history of the federal court and then how the Supreme Court came into being and all these museums are open to the public. Yes, presently uh, some work is going on in our Supreme Court Museum so it is closed for a while. Uh, but all the High Court Museums and the Supreme Court Museum are open to the public. Regularly the law students and the school students and the visitors are there. Uh, every Saturday in, in, we have it in Supreme Court Museum, we have the visitors, we permit them because the courts are not in session on yes. Saturdays. And of course other museums, they are regularly there. there. Recently in Orissa, just Chief, Honorable Chief Justice Murli Dursar has come out with a very beautiful museum, uh, judicial museum in Katak. They have converted the uh, old Chief Justice's bungalow into a museum and where they have given uh, all the legal history and also the district court records. Some of the interesting records there, uh, sorry I have not yet been there but very soon I am going to visit that. So exciting times ahead for uh, the judiciary. Uh, I'd like to now move to the Department of Pharmaceuticals and we've got the Secretary and Ms. Aparna here with us. Uh, Ma'am, could you tell us a little about the development of museums that may be perhaps more scientific than, uh, you know, our, and particularly of your ministry, they might be more scientific in nature than the other museums that we've talked about so far. So thank you, Riniji. And uh, first of all, I would like to start by commending the Ministry of Culture uh, under the leadership of uh, Secretary Gobin Mohan and his fine team uh, that is present here for having organized this. I think uh, this is probably the first and prob probably the largest international museum expo that we have seen uh, recently, at least in India. And uh, I do hope that it is a sign of things to come in terms of the attention that we are able to uh, pay to this huge heritage that we have in terms of uh, tangible heritage, of course, uh, and also the cultural heritage. Uh, normally, you are right in uh, mentioning that, you know, heritage is something or museums are uh, places that we associate with uh, history, with uh, heritage, with culture. But there is also a huge uh, potential for and in fact existence of uh, museums that go into the history of the sciences. Uh, the, in the Indian context we have the National Science Centre, the Indian Science Centre of course, uh, right here next to Trapps Museum there is one. And uh, I do believe that individual sciences have small collections that may uh, be exhibited in the form of the heritage of that science. Uh, I am currently Secretary of Pharmaceutical, so I will be able to speak about that sector. And pharmaceutical is a science which is not a pure science. It is an applied science. It has a lot of biology, chemistry, etc. in it. A lot of clinical uh, aspects are also covered. And we are lucky in the sense, fortunate, that we do have uh, uh, what, what we call a pharmacy heritage center not exactly a museum, but a pharmacy. But heritage because center. it is technical in nature, there might be challenges that you have when you face for the particularly um, for the pharmaceutical. So, uh, what I would say is that having visited that heritage center, and it's a small one, one can see that one needs a kind of a continuum from the heritage of that science to the current. Uh, status and the future potential or emerging technologies in that science. So for example, the pharmacy center, heritage center has prehistoric, proto-historic, ancient, medieval, colonial development of the pharmacy science. It has the Indian systems like the Ayurveda and the Unani sections. It also has what we know as pharmaceuticals in terms of chemically synthesized products. So, and like uh, Umaji mentioned, it has a gallery of the luminaries. So we know who are our ancestors, so to say, or forefathers who have contributed to the development of the science. So it is not exactly a technical museum, but I do see the potential for developing museums that can showcase technological advances both in the past and those that are emerging. I believe it will be uh, an addition or it's a, a 
contribution to the development of this sector among but Muslims? It's an eye-opener for me, someone like me who, you know, probably is not aware of uh, something like this. But, you know, this is, a, this is a question that I have, that how do you generate interest in people who perhaps have not, you know, even come across an idea like a pharmaceutical museum. I mean, I would have thought of it as a technical museum. It is a scientific museum. So how do you generate interest and get foot forward? I think uh, one challenge is that many of these museums are located within the premises of either educational or research institutions. So access, as in the case of the courts, does become a little challenging because you have students and faculty on campus. So that is the physical challenge of making it accessible to people. But are there outreach programs? Yes. There? So the second challenge is the lack of awareness. And since uh, Govindji has you know, titled this discussion as Breaking Silos, uh, I don't think that this can be a watershed moment for the Ministry of Culture to take leadership in creating a portal where museums and heritage centers located in different ministries and departments of the government of India and maybe even the private sector can have a presence on a portal so that there is greater chance of somebody coming across the existence of that. There are museums like Rail Museum that I'm sure, uh, you know, Binaji will talk about or the National Philatelic Museum which are better known because there are aficiandos, right? There are stamp collectors, there are train spotters. But you wouldn't have somebody for a for a museum on let's say plasma research. No, so it's interesting. Would I mean it's interesting in terms of Ayurveda, it's interested in terms of you know Yunani or Siddha or whatever it is. We have photographs of the original building of Dagur, for example, set up in the 19th century already more than 150 years old. So it would have public interest if we had an option or a possibility of reaching out through a common portal which has got greater visitorship and greater visibility. So you're adding work for Mr. Ward to kind of, you know, take cues from. So adding pleasant work. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think the you know ultimate gain is for our uh, people and I think that is something that we should not let off on. Uh, I'd like to now uh, go on to, you, know, you mentioned uh, the Rail uh, Museum. Uh, we've got with us uh, Manita Srinivasta who is the uh, Executive Director of Heritage at the Railway Board. Uh, Ma'am, the Rail Museum in Delhi is the first transport museum in the country. What was the purpose of creating a museum of this kind? 